Good morning, everyone. Yeah, there we go. You've got more enthusiasm for me than for Kurt. That's the way it should be. So I'm really happy to... You understand. You have to say good day to this guy. Yeah, good day, mate. How's it going? Uh, okay, so Kurt asked me to start off my talk this morning by uh, introducing myself to you. So my first slide is, who am I? As Kurt's already made fun of, uh, I sound funny because I come to Australia, from Australia. Luckily, I wasn't eaten by a dingo when I was a baby. Okay, so I kind of, uh, as a kid, I perhaps wasn't uh, like all of you guys and necessarily uh, that passionate about science. I spent most of sort of my teens chasing a little tennis ball around the tennis court. And up until I reached 15 and realized I was going to stay this small and never grow uh, anymore, I thought I was going to become a professional tennis player. Uh, at age of 15, I was still this height, wasn't getting any bigger, so I needed to do something else. I did my undergraduate in Australia, and I thought I was going to be a mathematician, but I had a chemistry professor who I found inspiring. I did research uh, with him, and my career has kind of stayed in chemistry all the way through until I've arrived at Yale, where I work uh, here. So I don't just work by myself. I have a great team, which I'm fortunate enough to be a part of. Uh, two of my team, or three of my team, are here today. They're going to help out with some demonstrations. So that's Louise and Hiwan uh, sitting in the front row. And together, uh, me and my team, so this is the full team here, well, except for these two guys here who you can see a photobombed uh, picture. <laughs> We're interested in converting carbon dioxide into useful materials. And I'll talk more about this throughout today's talk. But this is a topic which is not just of interest to people at Yale. Uh, my group and I are also part of a team which includes researchers at Brown University uh, in Rhode Island. And together, we've formed a larger group of scientists which are, who are interested in this general problem of trying to convert carbon dioxide into useful materials. So our center is called the Center for the Capture and Conversion of CO2. OK, so what am I going to tell you about? We're going to start off today by explaining to you guys why we think what we're doing is important. Why is it perhaps going to solve problems that we as a society are currently encountering? And to do this, I'm going to explain to you what is global warming, what is carbon dioxide, and how can we use carbon dioxide as an alternative feedstock. Then I'm going to give you some tools so that you can understand the science that we do. So you might not know the answers to these questions at the moment. What are catalysts? Why use transition metals? But I hope in today's talk, I will explain those to you. And then we'll finish off by presenting some of our scientific results. And in all three of these sections, we'll try and do some demonstrations so you can see firsthand what we actually do in the lab and how we perform our experiments. OK, so let's start off with a very big picture question. You've all probably heard about global warming. But what exactly is global warming? So global warming is the increase in temperature of the Earth's atmosphere and oceans. So let's have a look at some data. If we have a look at this graph, and if we set 1950 as being zero degrees, you can see that in the years before 1950, the temperatures were colder than they are now, where in the, in the years after 1950, the temperature has gradually been increasing. So this is the average global temperature of uh, both the air and the oceans. And furthermore, you can see that of the 13 warmest years since 1880, which is when our records go back to, 11 of them have been in the years 2001 to 2011. Scientists have started to try and predict what is going to happen to global temperature over the next 100 years. And even if we take the most conservative value, you can see that they predict there's going to be an average increase in the temperature of around 2 degrees Celsius by the year 2100, in the most conservative case, 
and up to 5 degrees Celsius in the most extreme case. So what are the potential effects, both for the environment and also for us, of global warming? Well, we have a lot of ice on the planet at the moment. And if the temperatures rise, that ice is going to melt. If that ice melts, the sea levels will rise. And this will result in the extinction of some species which require that ice to survive. So here we have a polar bear who's stuck as his iceberg is melting. So this will lead to an increase in heat waves and droughts. So these are kind of the predicted changes to our climate, which are a potential consequence of global warming. What are the potential implications for us? Well, one, if there's less land that we can farm, this can mean a decrease in food supplies, which could obviously have catastrophic areas. If you're fortunate or perhaps unfortunate enough to own a beachside property, as the sea level increases, your beachside property could, could flood. And also, there have been studies which believe that there could be a negative effect on human health because of problems with respiration as the global temperature increases. So what causes global warming? Right, what can we do if we understand what causes it? Maybe this will allow us to understand how we can prevent it. So there are a number of gases which are known as greenhouse gases. And these essentially trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. And greenhouse gases are some very common materials. They're things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and ozone. And actually, greenhouse gases are essential for our survival. If there were no uh, naturally occurring greenhouse gases, the temperatures on Earth would be approximately 59 degrees Fahrenheit colder than they are right now. So imagine if today was 59 degrees colder, it would be worse than when we had the polar vortex. OK, but the problem is, what happens if we put extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Right? What happens if we're generating more carbon dioxide? Well, then we get global warming. And the reality is that carbon dioxide is by far the greenhouse gas that we are responsible for putting into the atmosphere in far larger quantities than would be naturally occurring. So what is carbon dioxide? Just a reminder for some of you in terms of chemistry, it's a ca central carbon atom which is bonded to two oxygen atoms. And under normal circumstances, carbon dioxide is a gas. So you can't see it or smell it. There's lots of carbon dioxide already in the ocean. And a potential consequence of rises in uh, the temperature is this the carbon dioxide in the ocean will uh, be released and cause even more global warming. And a problem is that as a society, we currently don't have very many uses for carbon dioxide. Does anyone know what some of the uses for carbon dioxide are? Where do you probably encounter carbon dioxide every day? Does anyone in here like to drink soft drinks? Right? People drink Coke. OK, so Coke has carbon dioxides. So some of you might be too old, but have you guys ever seen the candy, uh, Pop Rocks? Okay, I need a volunteer. Who wants to try some of this Pop Rocks? All right, you're the closest, so you can do this. All right, I want you, you can open it up, and then we're going to ask you what happens uh, when you eat the Pop Rock. Okay, so we use CO2 uh, in fire extinguishers. Probably the major industrial use of CO2 is in urea. This is a compound which is used as a fertilizer. Uh, it's also used in explosives and in glues and in the automobile industry. And here we have some solid carbon dioxide, which also has uh, several uses. And we're going to do some demonstrations with that in a minute. OK, what's your name? Tanisha. Tanisha. OK, you're going to try some of these pop rocks for us? OK, put them in your mouth and tell us what's ha what happens. It's popping, right? Because a pop rock essentially has dissolved carbon dioxide, little carbon dioxide bubbles in this solid. And when your 
saliva comes in contact with the solid, it dissolves it, and it releases the carbon dioxide. So you can feel this tingling sensation in your mouth as the carbon dioxide uh, is released. And we have many more pop rocks which we'll hand out over the course of today's lecture. Okay, so carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature. But if you freeze it, it can become a solid. Louise, you want to show everyone some solid carbon dioxide? So there you can see we have some uh, dry ice, it's called pellets. And these are commonly used as a material for cooling substances because a solid dry ice pellet, has a it becomes a solid at a temperature of about minus 78 degrees Celsius. So if I try and hold on to this for too long, I'm going to burn my hand. But an interesting property of carbon dioxide is, can you guys see this here? If we put a few more pellets down. I'm going to leave that here. And by the end of the lecture, you're not going to be able to see the carbon dioxide. But you're not going to see a liquid. That's because at this pressure, carbon dioxide sublimes. So it goes directly from a solid to a gas. OK, so now we have some balloons. One of these balloons is full of nitrogen. We have another balloon which is full of carbon dioxide. And then we're going to get some liquid nitrogen. And Louise is going to take the balloon full of N2, and she's going to put it in liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, does anyone know how cold liquid nitrogen is? It's minus 196 degrees Celsius. So that's a lot colder than the polar vortex. OK, we're going to dip the N2 balloon in there. OK, maybe we're not. OK, well, let's, this balloon is full of carbon dioxide. OK, we prepared it earlier on. We're going to dip the balloon full of carbon dioxide in there. What do you guys think is going to happen? I said carbon dioxide becomes a... Uh, Solid at minus 78, liquid nitrogen is at minus 196. Louise is going to pull the balloon out and look at that. And she's going to shake it. It's like a maraca. Right? That's the solid carbon dioxide in there. And then we're slowly going to watch the balloon uh, return to its normal state. OK, so that's some of the properties of carbon dioxide, which mean that you know, when the carbon dioxide is in this balloon, we can't see it, we can't smell it. Right? You can just see the balloon. What Louise is going to do while uh, I keep talking, is she's going to fill up a glove with uh, dry ice. And we're going to see what happens to that. And she's also going to put some dry ice in that Coke bottle and then put a balloon on top of that Coke bottle, and later on in the talk, we'll come back to that. OK, so we are releasing carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere. That's what's perhaps causing global warming. And why do we make this correlation? We make this correlation because here I have a plot of the increase in the global average temperature and the increase in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And you can see that both of these lines follow exactly the same trend. And on that basis, we believe that carbon dioxide or an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is responsible for global warming. And the reality is the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is greater at the present time than in any other point in the last 800,000 years. OK, so where is all of this carbon dioxide coming from? So we all like to do things which require energy. So how many of you arrived here by car? 
Okay, most of us arrived here by car. Anyone walk? Okay, I'm probably the only one who walked. So, in order to power your car, you typically use uh, petroleum, and this comes from oil. And oil, coal, and natural gas are types of fossil fuels. So fossil fuels are formed by natural processes, but it takes a very long time for these fossil fuels to form. And currently, or if we look at 2006, almost 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Okay, so all of the things that we know and love to do, using a computer, uh, using TV, uh, heating our place, need these fossil fuels. And these fossil fuels release CO2 when we burn them, and that is bad from the environment because it's causing global warming. It's also true that accessible sources of fossil fuels are running out. And this means we need another energy source, both in order to continue with our current lifestyle, but also to preserve our environment. So you guys have probably all heard of some kinds of renewable energy sources. They are, for example, wind energy, energy from biofuels, and the big one is solar energy. And I'm not going to talk to you about these things today, but as a society, in the next 50 years, it's probably imperative for us to transition to these alternative sources of energy. And many people, both at Yale and in other universities and industries in the world, are working to try and create these alternative energies. But there is a problem with changing to these alternative energies. And that comes from the fact that at the moment, most of the products that we engage with are actually derived from the petrochemical industry. So what do I mean by this? Let's take a barrel of oil. And m about 50% of the oil, slightly more, is used for gasoline, liquefied petroleum, heavy fuel oil. But about a third of the oil is used to make other products and other distillates. Okay, so at the moment, many products that we use in everyday life come from oil. So what are these products? Okay, so all the paint which was used in this room. Cosmetics, right? If you're like me, you want to gel your hair, you want to look pretty, that comes from the cosmetic comes from oil. You know, this morning I had a bath, I had my rubber ducky. The rubber ducky also comes from uh, petroleum products. You've all got water bottles in front of you. They use plastics. That comes from oil. Okay, your cars have many components, cleaning agents, and you know, all of these types of small gadgets which are used in functioning machines. So if we stop using oil, how are we going to make these important products? So at the moment, we have about one to five carbon sources, which are oil, natural gas, coal. The things that produce uh, greenhouse gases like CO2 and are bad for the environment, and we don't want to use them. We convert them to about 100 base chemicals, so these are things like acrylic acid, ethylene, formic acid, and then they're converted into even more chemicals, which are the chemicals which are in all of the products around us. In contrast to that, carbon dioxide, which is our most abundant source of carbon, is basically not used as a feedstock for any of these products. And what we want to do is we want to flip this cycle around. So instead of using oil and natural gas as our carbon feedstock to make all the products that we know and love, we want to use carbon dioxide as our feedstock. Okay, so why do we want to use carbon dioxide as a feedstock? It's readily available, it's non-toxic, and it's cheap. And so I have a vi little video which summarizes the center that I'm involved in, which will illustrate everything that I've just shown using an animation.
OK, so that's the challenge or the problem that we're trying to solve. Let's go back and have a look at our balloons and our gloves. So you can see, look at what's happened to these gloves that Louise has put CO2 in. The CO2 has sublimed, and they've now expanded. And our balloon on top of our Coke bottle has also expanded as the CO2 has sublime. And they're going to keep expanding, and we might be in for a shock later on uh, in the lecture. OK, so we know what we want to do. How are we going to do it? Right? It's hard to convert carbon dioxide into anything useful. Part of the reason it's such a potent greenhouse gas is it just stays in the atmosphere. It doesn't do anything. It's there for hundreds of thousands of years. So once we put it in, we're stuck with it. And it's stable because it doesn't really react with other molecules. Right? There's some things, you know, if I take one molecule and another model, molecule, I'll readily make something new. With carbon dioxide, that is extremely hard to do. So the question that we have to answer is how do we increase the rate at which two chemicals react with each other? I want to take carbon dioxide, I want to take something else, and I want to make something new. How do I make that happen? And this is the background to the science that we do in our lab. And so a substance that will increase the rate of a reaction is known as a catalyst. And a catalyst is a particularly uh, important substance because a catalyst will increase the rate of the reaction, but it won't be consumed in the reaction. So I get it back at the end of the reaction in the same form that I put it in. And catalysts are used every day in society. So almost 90% of the millions of chemicals that are produced are produced using catalysts. So let's see how a catalyst works. So if I have A plus B, right, and A plus B could be something like carbon monoxide plus hydrogen. If I have two tanks, one of carbon, dioxide, carbon monoxide and one of hydrogen, and I mix them together, nothing is going to happen. I can leave them for 500,000 years, nothing is going to happen. If I take a tank of carbon, dioxide, of carbon monoxide and hydrogen, and I add a small amount of a catalyst, I can produce gasoline in minutes. Right? And what this small amount of catalyst is doing is it's facilitating this reaction, which would inherently otherwise be extremely slow. So how can we consider that? For every chemical reaction, there is a certain amount of energy which needs to be put into the system to facilitate that reaction. If I add a catalyst, I decrease the amount of energy that I need to put in. And by decreasing the amount of energy that I need to put in, I increase the rate of the reaction. So typically, a catalyst will interact with uh, the molecules that are reacting. But at the end of the reaction, it will come out in the same form that it went in. So here we can see an energy profile for a reaction. So you start off with your reactants. They interact with the catalyst, which is called M. Then we need to put in some energy to go over a barrier. And then you get another product, an intermediate, which has the catalyst bound. We go over another barrier. And we get a product and a catalyst bound. And we can draw this as a cycle, because our catalyst is able to go round and round converting our reactant to our product. In principle, a catalyst is recoverable, but often industrially, we can't recover it. OK, so let me give you an analogy that will help you understand how a catalyst works. Let's say uh, I want to go, go over a really big hill. OK, so you guys are young and fit. You probably have the energy to go all the way over that hill. But I'm old. I'm slow. I don't have enough energy to go over there. So I need a catalyst to help me. So what would be the equivalent of a catalyst? Let's say I built a uh, pathway through the hill, like a tunnel. Right? That tunnel is a lower energy path, which will get me from one side of the hill to the other without having to put in 
anywhere near as much effort. So that's what a catalyst is analogous to in terms of an example we can all understand. Okay, so the beauty of a catalyst is I can put in one molecule of catalyst and I can make up to a million mole molecules of product. So for example, if we look at one of these water bottles, these water bottles were made using a catalyst. And the catalyst is so good that the catalyst is still in this water bottle. It's a zirconium catalyst, and they put in one molecule of the catalyst to make a th million molecules of the plastic. And therefore, there's so little zirconium in here that it doesn't need to be removed before it's safe for us to drink from this bottle. Okay, so we need some way of measuring how good a catalyst is, right? We want to know if we make a new catalyst in our lab, is that any good? And we can measure how efficient a catalyst is by looking at two quantities, the turnover number and the turnover frequency. So the turnover number is if I put in one molecule of catalyst, how many molecules of product do I make? The turnover frequency is how fast do I do it? Because that's important. If my catalyst will give me a million molecules of product, but it will take 100,000 years, that's probably not very good for practical purposes. I want a catalyst which will turn over 100,000 times in a minute, and then I'll get my product very quickly. OK, so let's give you guys uh, an example. So let's consider a reaction that has 1% catalyst loading. So this means I have one molecule of catalyst to 100 molecules of substrate. If I get 80% of my product at the end of the reaction, how many times is my catalyst turning over? Does anyone have any ideas? Okay, the number of times the catalyst turns over is how many molecules of product am I going to get? So here, I'm getting 80 molecules of product, and I've put in one molecule of catalyst. So how many times is it turning over? 80, right? Good. You get some more pop rocks. OK, so it turns over 80 times in two hours. So how many times does that mean my catalyst is turning over per hour? 40, right? So 40 is my turnover frequency. OK, but typically, a chemical reaction doesn't go at a constant rate. So if you look at the graph down the bottom, you can see that the chemical reaction goes fast at the start and then slows down. So we often just look at this initial rate to get the turnover frequency. So these are some of the chemical tools for assessing how good my catalyst is. But how many of you guys want to be rich? OK, so if you want to, Kurt wants to be rich. So if you want to be rich, and I come to you with my catalyst, and I say my catalyst turns over 100,000 times, and Kurt comes to you, and he says his catalyst turns over a million times, and maybe Kurt's catalyst also turns over faster than my catalyst. But does that mean you're going to use Kurt's catalyst and not my catalyst? What other things do you have to consider? Price, right? How expensive is the catalyst? How selective is the catalyst? Does it give one product only, or does it give a mixture of products? So there are other factors which are important in determining whether or not your catalyst is going to be practically useful. So what we want to do is we want to develop catalysts for carbon dioxide conversion. I just told you that carbon dioxide is a very Wow, there we go. We just lost one of our uh, balloons, right? It filled up with too much carbon dioxide and it burst. But we want to come up with a way of converting carbon dioxide into reactive species, and we need to discover catalysts. So in particular, my group uses transition metal catalysts. And we don't have a periodic table in here, but, period but in the periodic table, transition metals are a specific group of metals. Does anyone know some examples of transition metals? Yeah. 
Iron, right? Iron is one of the most abundant transition metals. Anyone else have any ideas on transition metals? Gold? Is gold a transition metal? We'll give you gold. It's somewhat... Uh, I can't, you can come, we can come down at the end. Gold, okay, what else? P copper, okay, what else? Pardon? Titanium, yeah. Silver, okay, so there are probably around uh, 20, 28 to 30 transition metals. And the reason that we use them is that you can very easily control the properties of the transition metal. So how can we change the properties of the transition metal? We change the properties by changing what is connected to the transition metal. Okay, so here we have some beakers. And these beakers all contain nickel, which has six water molecules bound to it. So you can see we get this beautiful green color. Whose favorite color is green? Yeah, some people, do you guys like this green? Okay, so. What I'm going to show you, and what Juan and Louise are going to demonstrate, is that we can change the properties, and one of the properties of a compound is its color, by changing what's bound to uh, nickel. So first, what they're going to do is they're going to take some nickel, and they're going to add ammonia, which is NH3, to the nickel solution. Louise is pouring it in now, and she's going to stir Stir, 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 Louise, stir. So you guys, can you see what's happening? What color has it gone? Blue. And we've also had a little bit of solid uh, precipitate out. And the reason that that's happened is we've replaced the water molecules which are bound to nickel with some ammonia molecules. And clearly, you can see that we've changed the properties of the nickel by doing that. And we've gone from a green compound to a blue compound. Question. Oh, so I've written the chemical formula for ammonia. So like carbon dioxide is CO2, ammonia is NH3. It's comprised of one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. Okay, so we could use ammonia to go from green to, from green to blue. We can add a different compound. And this compound is known as ethylene diamine. And we're just going to add one molecule of ethylene diamine compared to the nickel. Louise, he won, you ready? Okay, let's watch the beaker he won's going to pour into. You can see she's going to stir, stir, stir. And now we get a much more vibrant and beautiful blue, in my opinion, because we've made a different compound where we've now replaced two water molecules with one equivalent of uh, ethylene diamine. Okay, so we can change the properties even more. Now, we're going to take our ammonia compound. And to our ammonia compound, we're going to add one equivalent of our ethylene diamine. He won, Louise, are we ready? OK, so this is the beaker in the middle. No, I want to add it to this guy. OK, okay. so we're going to add one equivalent of ethylene diamine to that one. Are we ready? Okay, so let's go here one, and then we're going to stir. Wow, and we get another color change. And now you can see that the color of this molecule, which has four ammonias and one ethylene diamine, is different to the color of this molecule, which has four waters and one ethylene diamine. And so finally, what we're going to do is we're going to replace all of the waters or ammonia with ethylene diamine. So we're going to make this molecule, which only has ethylene diamine coordinated to it. So we can do it to the end beaker just by adding a lot of ethylene diamine. You can see we now get this beautiful, vibrant purple. And if we take some ethylene diamine and we add it to our ammonia solution with one ethylene diamine in the middle, so second from left, guys. We're going to get the same color. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, and you're going to see that change to the same as the far beaker. So what this is showing you, question? Can I change it, the, um, the one where you just added it to? Before, she kept mixing it, and then she added it to the other one. Okay, so if you imagine um, you have water, and you put sodium chloride into the water, the sodium chloride will dissolve, right? But what happens if I keep adding sodium chloride? Eventually, I would have added so much sodium chloride that it will no longer be dissolved in the water. So in the case of that compound, we had so much of the compound that it was no longer soluble. And because we're making four different, solu four different compounds, they have different solubilities. And so some of them are less soluble than other ones and were starting to precipitate out. OK, so you know, color is one. Uh, property that I can change. It's not a particularly interesting property in terms of me facilitating chemical reactions, but it's great as a demonstration for you guys. Another property of transition metal complexes is that they are very reactive. So we can't do it in the lecture hall, but there are transition metal compounds that my group works with which will spontaneously react with dioxygen and they'll catch fire. But that's good because carbon dioxide is an extremely stable molecule. So we need something that is very reactive that is going to be able to react with that. And so what we can do is we can take, now we have a nickel compound, it has different uh, molecules bound to it, and we can bind carbon dioxide. Or we can take a uranium compound and we can bind carbon dioxide. And what happens is that when we bind carbon dioxide to the metal, we change its properties. We might make it more reactive. And you can think of this as being like a tug of war, where now the metal is binding to carbon dioxide and weakening it, and then something else can come in and react with the carbon dioxide. Whereas if the metal wasn't reacting with the carbon dioxide, it would be much less reactive. You're having two opposite forces act on carbon dioxide. OK, so let me spend the last 10 minutes telling you a little bit about the actual science that my group does. So the particular question that we're interested in is can we take carbon dioxide and make this chemical formic acid? So here is formic acid. Uh, it's this molecule here. It has one carbon, two oxygens, and two hydrogens. And we use a lot of this compound, about 720,000 tons per year. We use it for a variety of applications, including insecticides, for tanning leather goods. And the way we make it at the moment is not optimal, because basically we take uh, methanol and carbon monoxide, and we make this molecule methyl formate. Then we can convert the methyl formate to formic acid. But to do this, we need to huge use a huge amount of water. And then you have to separate the water from the formic acid. This is a very expensive process. Alternatively, you can take your methyl formate and you can add uh, ammonia. You can make the uh, amide. And then you can hydrolyze it to make formic acid. But if you use this route, you generate all of this ammonium sulfate. And you now have a waste product, which is not useful. And what we want to do is we want to take hydrogen and CO2 and make formic acid. So you can see that in principle, there's no waste products from this reaction. Right? All of our reactants are being incorporated into our product. So what got us started in this? A group in Japan had shown that you could take an iridium compound. So now we have a periodic table. And you can see that iridium is here. So it's one of the transition metals. You can take this iridium compound. You can take H2 and CO2. And you can make formic acid. And this catalysts are pretty good. They turn over about 3.5 million times. OK, that's great for a catalyst if it has a high turnover number. But the problem is. This catalyst doesn't work in water. And if you want to do something commercially to make formic acid on a large scale, people want a catalyst which works in water. So what my group did was we wanted to look 
at this catalyst. We wanted to understand how it works, and then we wanted to see if we could do that chemistry in water. So the first thing we noticed was that if you take this iridium compound, you have this iridium attached to a hydride. This reacts with CO2, and it makes a new compound where you have iridium oxygen and you have carbon hydrogen. But this reaction is not very energetically favorable. And what that means is that if I remove the CO2 from this compound, it goes back to this compound. Right? And that makes it difficult to study. I can't isolate this molecule. So my group did some theory. Right, We modeled how could we change our complex. Just like we changed the properties of the colors of these nickel complexes, how could we modify our iridium complex to make it more favorable for it to interact with CO2, which might help us design a better catalyst? So to do that, we played with the ligand, or we played with what was bound to iridium directly opposite this hydride. So we put all different kinds of elements from the periodic table opposite this hydride, and our calculations would tell us how favorable this reaction with CO2 would be. And our calculations predicted that one molecule, this molecule here, would interact in a significantly more favorable manner with carbon dioxide. So what we did was we made that compound in the lab. We were able to prove that we made that compound. I won't tell you how, but we did that. And then we took that compound and we reacted it with CO2. And we were able to get this compound here. Here you can see the molecular drawing of this compound. And quite clearly, CO2 is incorporated into it. And we were able to get this compound and we could store it uh, outside in the atmosphere. So we got good agreement between our experiment and our theory. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to use this compound for catalysis in water. Could we take this compound, add H2 and CO2, and make formic acid? And the answer is yes. We could do this, and we could get about 350,000 turnovers. So one molecule of iridium generated 350,000 molecules of formic acid. That's pretty good. It's not as good as the system that we started off with, but our system works in water. So I said at the start that this thing is a catalyst. So what is our catalytic cycle? So here we have this compound. We believe that it interacts with the hydrogen, right? That releases uh, something in the form of formate or formic acid and makes a new compound. That compound is converted to a different compound, which then reacts with CO2 to get us back to our starting point. Okay, so our catalyst is not being altered in this reaction. All that's happening is it's facilitating CO2 plus H2 going to formate or formic acid. So you would think that the problem is solved. Does anyone know where we get iridium from? How many people had heard of iridium before this talk? Yeah, you know where we get iridium from, or you've heard of iridium? From meteors, right? So here we have a graph of the most uh, common elements uh, in Earth. And let's look at that. So if we look at that, look where iridium is. And this is on a log scale, which means these gaps are even more large than they appear. Iridium is right down the bottom. It's the least abundant. Uh, metal. So what does this mean about iridium? There's not much. And if there's not much, it means it's going to be expensive, right? Look at the other things which are around iridium. Things like platinum, gold, the type of things that people like as rings, right? They're expensive gifts. But that's no good for making a chemical. If we want to make, use these as a catalyst in a high turnover process on a large scale, we want to use something which is cheap. Okay, so what are the things which are cheap? Things like iron, manganese, titanium. So as you go down the periodic table, things tend to get more expensive and more rare. 
So we are now trying to do this same chemistry on iron that we're doing on iridium. We've again managed, we need to make an iron complex and we've been able to do that. And we've been able to prove that we make these intermediates. So here are some molecular structures. And we now have an iron system which is catalytically active. We can take H2 and CO2 and we can make formate or formic acid. There's only one problem. So our iridium catalyst turned over 350,000 times. Our iron catalyst only turns over 17 times. And so that's not good enough. And what we're doing in our group at the moment is we're trying to improve this iron catalyst so that it has comparable reactivity to iridium and then it might be practical for people to use for CO2 conversion. So let me uh, tell you what we're trying to do. We're trying to develop catalysts for the incorporation of CO2 into catalysts, into fine chemicals. We have something which might be able to make formic acid, which is one commodity chemical. But if you go back to that slide at the start where I said, well, we need to make the hundreds of thousands of chemicals and we need to make these five base chemicals from CO2, we still have a long way to go. And with this team at Brown, some of the other chemicals that we're trying to make from carbon dioxide are acrylic acid. So acrylic acid is used in super absorbent polymers. Methanol, which is used as a feedstock for the production of many chemicals. And ethylene, which is used to make a lot of plastics. Okay, so this is sort of the full team uh, that I work with. Uh, Louise and Hiwon uh, don't do any of the work I talked about today, but they're part of the team. So I think we've got time. So I want to finish off with one more sort of video. And this video shows a catalytic reaction. And so it comes from a scientist in England. And this reaction, he's doing the opposite to what we're trying to do. He's trying to liberate CO2 from a reaction. But you're going to see exactly what happens when he adds his catalyst. Okay, so there you go. That was an example of an actual catalytic reaction. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture this morning. Thank you very much for coming, and I'm happy to answer any questions.